Welcome to the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show, episode number 74, with Dan Zatofsky on passively investing in emerging markets. I'm Dan Breslin, host of the REI Diamond Show. Today, I have the pleasure of finally interviewing Dan Zatofsky. Dan and I met at the IMN Single Family Rental Conference held in Miami earlier this year, where we were both speaking, and uh, we have been trying to get this episode on a schedule ever since, but both of us have just kept missing pass. So we're finally here. For those of you that don't know, Dan is a high volume investor, mostly landlord and passive investor whose goal is to become the bank. And he has selected a few that he considers around the nation emerging markets where he first invests his own money before bringing in JV partners to share in the opportunities that he finds. You'll definitely want to grab a pen and pad for this episode because Dan drops a few jewels of wisdom you definitely won't want to miss, including his favorite three emerging markets in the United States, his top four deal sources, and of course, a whole lot more. So let's jump right into it, shall we? Welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Dan. So, you know, I know a lot of people know who you are in a lot of the same circles that we roll in the Philadelphia and other markets. But for those listeners that don't know who Dan Zatofsky is, can you give a brief Reader's Digest version about how you kind of started in the business and the, maybe a little bit of what your business looks like today? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, thanks again. Basically, I started in the business about 26 years ago as, a, as somebody just coming out of the teenage years, uh, wanting to follow his grandfather's footsteps, but real tough trying to raise my own money. I was able to start off with a rental property, and from there, I grew that portfolio from rentals to uh, I started wholesaling at one point. I started doing, like everyone else, the fix and flips, and then started building up a pretty pretty nice extensive rental portfolio in different parts of different emerging markets in the United States. And what that did for me, it made me realize uh, a lot of things. Passive income, it made me realize what I do and I don't like doing as far as property management or managing property managers, dealing with contractors or realtors or, or whatever it might be, down to the point of you know legal and taxes and everything like that. Probably about 15, 16 years ago, I realized at the time I had a little over 60 properties. I was self-managing uh, in the Trenton, Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey area. And I realized at that point it was becoming a full-time job for me. And it was something I didn't really enjoy doing as much. And it, it just stuck to me that at that point, I said, you know what? At, every time I have a problem, every time a tenant doesn't pay, every time a toilet bowl breaks, every time there's a roof issue, and this is happening multiple times per day. I'm getting three or four calls every day at minimum from tenants um, or rents not being paid. I said, you know, these banks, they keep getting paid. And I decided at that point, I said, there's got to be something better to this. And my goal, at least 15 years ago, was to become the bank. From there, I found many ways to do that, you know, from private lending to buying notes or non-performing assets. And what I really specialize in now is, I do a lot of different things in the business, but I really specialize in taking a non-performing asset and turning it into a performing asset and hoping they become the bank for long-term passive wealth. And when I say that, I do everything from uh, buy non-performing notes. I'm a, I'm a first guy. I don't do too much in the seconds business. So I buy non-performing notes. I buy tax liens. I buy distressed assets from sellers, from property managers, direct like everybody else does. But my exit strategies are so much different than everyone else, whereas everyone's looking to either fix and flip or they're looking to buy a property to rent it or they're looking to uh, just wholesale a note. My exit strategy is always, firstly, is based on get that note performing and try to make, try to retain some passive income. To the end is where most people don't want to go. I am, I'm only willing to buy a note that I'm willing to foreclose on. And it sounds a little crazy. And when I speak at these events, a lot of uh, big gurus out there tell me I'm nuts. But when I show my numbers and how I'm made whole in 12 to 18 months and my returns become, essentially, they become infinite at that point. You know, people's heads shake, and I always tell people, it's funny, because I said, if I tell you my returns, you probably wouldn't believe me. So I, mean, I think we need to get on a whiteboard. But um, this year has been a great year. Uh, like I said, I, I've done well over, I think at this point, we've done well over 1,000 private money transactions. We've, we've over 650 rentals, 400 fix and flips, 
I bought and sold two hotels. I own three multifamily units that I did this year alone. So I do still pick those up. But my ultimate goal at this point is is I'll fix and flip to now take that money and turn it into either uh, private money for somebody to take down a note portfolio to buy some tax liens because it's always geared at passive income. And it it comes down to my quality of life and what I love to do. And if anyone's heard me speak, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm out there. I'm not working my butt off. I mean, I'm sitting there and I'm vacation all summer and I'm getting things done. And what I do is, is basically I want to have enough time. I want to have the time and money to spend with my family and friends as I choose to do, when I choose to do it, how I want to do it. So rather than making $50,000 on a flip, I might take that property and rent it out. And then for my rental, I'll hold a note. I'll sell it to an investor. I'll hold a note for them. So now I help investors get into the business as well. And there's a certain ways I do that as well that we, we can really dig down if you want to later on. And then from there, I could sell off that note. I can keep that note, have it serviced where I don't even touch a check, or I could sell off partials on that note. And uh, I'm really hands off. I'm really, and I always tell people I can never guarantee anything. And if anyone does guarantee you something, I would say run as fast as you could, don't walk. But I admit what I do guarantee is I mitigate the risk as best I possibly can. And when I when I, when I do my numbers, uh, we're lending out way under what market value is on those properties. So we're holding a note way under market value on those properties. And our ultimate goal is to hold notes for non-owner occupied investors for multiple reasons. So I hope that kind of sums it up in uh, what we've been doing and where we're heading. So I want to point something out. You talked about something, and I know that so I'm, I'm trying to listen from the listener's perspective. And I know a lot of people who are maybe early in the game or just getting into the business. And you see a lot of the gurus kind of selling the real estate dream. And, you know, the guy's got the coconut bowl with the umbrella sticking out and the straw. And he's got the, you know, he's sitting on the beach, right? And, oh, you could do this from the beach. And I think, like, I've had a challenge with, like, some newer people in their barrier to success being that they, like, believe that picture and that image of that vacation, you know, lifestyle but I don't think they realize always the work that goes behind it. And I just want to point out, Dan, that like, that's not the case for you. Like I see you on Facebook, you're, uh, you know, always in these nice, beautiful tropical kind of locations and things like that, but you're always grinding. I mean, you're talking about it and in, in putting the social proof out there on Facebook. So like for the people who are listening, who don't know who you are, it's like, you know, you're grinding, you're out there hustling. I mean, it really takes a level of hustle to get to that point. And like myself, when I'm on vacation or I'm sitting on the beach, you know, um, putting deals together, I'm making decisions. I'm on the laptop. I mean, I'm certainly working as hard as I am uh, oftentimes at my regular schedule and regular locations. So I just wanted to point that out as an example there. And one thing you talked about is emerging markets. And if anyone's listening, can you describe what is an emerging market? And can you give us an example of maybe three markets that you feel are uh, quality, high opportunity still, even though we've kind of seen rising real estate values around us where we still might find opportunities to buy and still have some upside? Sure, I'd love to. Great question, and I appreciate that. And I guess from what you said, your wife must be as happy with you on vacation as my wife is with me, right? Um, <laughs> you know, she had told me still, one point. Still she, single. Yeah, but you, she, uh, see, you, you, you're in a situation, but you know what? Um, I'm blessed to have great, great wife, great kids, and uh, they understand what I do, and they're involved. But uh, just off the side, side note here, my wife one time, she says, we ever just go on vacation without you getting a tax write-off? Do you, do you make this thing not business? So um, Not a chance. <laughs> you're right. You're right. I try to make the best out of every every situation I'm in. But sure, I'd love to. Emerging market, that's, that's a really hot topic and a really good topic, and it's a little different for everybody. It all depends on your goals. Uh, my goal in emerging market is I'm and and not to get too detailed on it. There's class buildings A, B, C, D. Uh, a being your best, B, D to being your worst. You know, crime ridden, drug ridden neighborhood. I'm more of a class B to C type buyer, which means I like the blue collar working class neighborhoods, pride of ownership. I don't even mind Section 8 as much, but I like the pride of ownership. I like the neighborhood gentrification happening. Um, emerging markets to me means companies coming into the market, growth happening, schools uh, getting better, infrastructure being put in, uh, grants for companies to, you know, tax tax advantages for companies to come in. I do a lot of research. I'm very, very big into the emerging market research. I don't just take what's going on out there because every guru out there is, that lives in the neighborhood is telling you to buy in their neighborhood. Um, I go as far as, you know, checking out the Economic Development Corp. I check out the school systems. 
I actually, believe it or not, I talk to people in the Chamber of Commerce in that market. I want to know what ha- – they know what's happening first. They know what companies are coming in, what permits are being filed. You want to see uh, how salaries are going, how unemployment is going. So that's some of the things. There, In my business, I also look at when I take down a non-performing note, because I'm very big in the non-performing note space, the paper space, rather than buying the property, I like to buy the paper, uh, and, then, and then have an exit strategy. When I do that, I look at other aspects as well. Besides it being an emerging market, I also want to look at length of time to foreclose in that market. What's the eviction process? Is it a judicial or a non-judicial state? Uh, these are things because, you know, when you when you buy an asset, whether it's a tax lien or a non-performing note, you could sit in that, you know, if you, you buy something in New York, New Jersey, Florida, you could sit in that asset for three, four years not getting paid back. So you want to look at the, that type of stuff. And it's very easy to research it. It's online, not hard. You can pick up a phone and speak to an attorney, speak to a title company. And that's the due diligence I do. And that's why my investors love working with us. They love joint venturing on deals with us. They love investing their money with us because they know we're not out there. And and I say this because it's so important. Some of the same groups I speak with, it's funny because I come out of an event that I speak at and and the people in the event are actually hitting me up, asking me for money to joint venture with them. But they don't know the first thing about the market they're in or they're in 10, 15 different markets without having an idea what they're doing. So when I ask them questions about, you know, who's on your team, that's the other thing in an emerging market. You need a team. Dan, I'm sure you have it. You're all over the place, and you're killing it as well. I mean, you're in Chicago. You're in Pennsylvania. You're in Atlanta, I think, in Florida. You're all over the place, and you're not doing that without a team in place. So it's all about your your people, processes, and systems, right? So that's part of my emerging market when I look at it. And uh, some of my favorite markets, obviously, I, I, I actually located in Delaware now. I did a lot in Delaware and Philadelphia. Uh, I've been all over the United States, did a lot in Arizona and Vegas. But right now, my favorite markets, I'll give you today, is uh, Cleveland. I love certain parts of Cleveland. And it's funny because when I tell people Cleveland, it melts drop. But if you haven't been to Cleveland, that's why we like Cleveland. I mean, it is. I mean, if you tell people Cleveland, they, they, they think I'm nuts. But if you haven't been to Cleveland in the last five years, you haven't. you, you don't know what you're missing. And right now, I have probably about another year, year and a half left there before it outprices us. Um, How about that? So that's why we do – yeah, that's why we do – what we're big on is I, I offer – we're real busy, but we offer usually two to three buyer stores a year where we have anywhere from five to ten people show up. And it's not a money-making thing for us, but what we want to do is we want anyone that wants to invest in those areas because a lot of our investors want to own their own portfolio of rental properties for the future. And it's a true turnkey investment property, true, true turnkey business, you know. But we want them to see the market because once they see the market, they truly understand what's going on in that market. And I can go through and I probably spend three hours right now talking about why I love each market. But that's what we, that's one in Cleveland I really love. I mean, I love what's going on with Cleveland Clinic. I love what's going on with downtown. I love these, how the city is just regentrifying these properties. You'll see, uh, uh, a mansion right next to a tenement, and the tenements are coming down within six months. I mean, they're really putting a lot of money into this market. So if you ever get down to downtown Cleveland where the sports complex is, you would see a whole different market. I love I love the Memphis, Tennessee market as well right now for what I do. I'm not, I'm not looking at it as fix and flip. I'm looking at it as a great emerging market for rental properties. And not there are rental properties there for $10,000. Those aren't the rental properties I work in. Um, you can, if you're a cash flow, just a pure cash flow buyer, and you don't mind uh, stolen copper, stolen HVAC systems, rent not being paid, crime in your area, you could buy those properties. What I like is, like I said, the emerging emerging part of Memphis, the class B to C type neighborhoods, high, a little bit higher end, better school systems, less crime, less problems. I'll put some more money in those properties. But I like that area. There's a ton going on in Memphis, Tennessee, which I could spend a couple hours talking about all the companies coming in and businesses coming in there as well. Now, the, one of the newest markets I really love right now, and I'm not there right now. Just time-wise, I haven't been able to get, get there and make it happen. But I am going to start moving into the uh, the Huntsville, Montgomery, Alabama market. The Madison area, is, uh, it's hitting all my numbers, right? A-rated schools. It's an A to B type area. Crime is lower than a third of national average right now for city to size. USA Today ranked them as one of the top 10 communities. There's more cash flow and blue collar in, you know, in certain parts of Huntsville than it is in Montgomery. So, I mean, like I said, I can go on and on for each area and the amount of research I do. And I don't take any investor money. But one thing with me too is 
I put my money up first before I ever touch investor money. So when I get into that Alabama market, Montgomery, the Huntsville uh, market in Alabama, I'll put my money up first. And what I do is I actually put teams together. So I'll go down there and I'll buy five to 10 properties and I'll screw things up and I'll find the right contractors, the right, I'll work with three different property managers until I find one I like. I'll work with realtors, I'll work with title companies, attorneys, and I'll get to know everybody in the town. And usually once I do that, six months to a year down the road, uh, I'll have a portfolio now that I could show people. And I, I, at that point, we could help them out. But, um, I mean, there's a ton of emerging markets. There's a ton of – there's probably a good 17 right now on my list that I like. But uh, my top my top two right now are obviously uh, Cleveland and Memphis and Delaware, and it's going to be followed by Alabama. So what is or what are your primary sources of deals? Because one of the things you mentioned was the length of time to foreclose. Like, I wouldn't care about that much because I'm usually dealing directly with sellers and we get title insurance, so I'm getting the title there. But can you describe – you know, your primary deal source, and if it's not necessarily one, um, maybe where all the deals are coming from, just kind of give people an example. Sure. I, I, my top, my, I'll give you my top four deal sources. Uh, one is asset man, special asset managers direct from the bank. We deal with the special asset managers, and we deal with hedge funds both, and that's where we get our non-performing notes from. Okay, so we're just buying the paper. We don't own the property. The difference between what you do and what we do at that point, Dan, is you're buying the property. You go to a title, you go to a title company. They switch title into your name. Everything's done. You own the property. Okay, we don't own the property. We're the bank. We're Chase Bank, Wells Fargo Bank, Bank of Bank of America. We actually have to go through and foreclose on this property to take ownership. Okay, so that's one way we actually get properties, and that could take. You know, we're going to court and we're foreclosing. Now there are times we get. We just, there's nine different exit strategies I have. We don't have to foreclose. We can call the owner up, and we have the opportunity that bank doesn't have. So I make it sound gloom, but it's a lot better. We're, buying the, the note is a lot better than buying the property because we can call the owner up, and we could do a lot. We're very flexible. We can waive some uh, back fees. We can lower the interest rate. We could do a lot to get the, seller, the, the owner of the property performing again. So if we get that owner performing again, we don't ever have to take the property and do any rehab. We just We just collect payments. We collect the mortgage from the owner. So when we're buying that property, sometimes as low as 20 cents on the dollar to 60, 70 cents on the dollar, we're actually, you know, you know how hard it is to find properties these days. There are people now, all these new HDTV buyers are out there bidding 80, 85 <laughs> cents on the, on the AR. I know you see it. Cause I, oh, yeah. You know, so it's not as easy to get properties as it used to be years ago. And, and we'll see a market correction and it'll get easier again. But so we're getting those properties right from the asset managers. We're also dealing directly tax liens. Tax liens, there's about 3,200 counties in the United States. So depending on the county you want to be in, you would either buy a tax lien or a tax deed. And uh, not to get in tax lien or tax deed classes. And I'm nowhere near an expert on teaching people about all the counties. I just know my counties that I buy in. But there's there's ways to buy those liens where you actually take ownership of the property. I'm sorry, the deed. So you take ownership of the property once you buy the deed. As long as the owner doesn't redeem it in their redemption period. And every county has different redemption periods. So I hope that makes sense so for people to understand that you want to look at the county and see what their ta- it's a tax lien or a tax deed state and what the redemption period is. And what the redemption period means is if you buy a if you buy a lien or a deed and they don't redeem that, if they have let's say a year to redeem it and the owner does not pay those taxes up in that time, you now own the property. So it's very important to know what the redemption period is. Um, the other couple places I get, I do a lot of direct from sellers. I have a big name out there, especially where I live in Delaware. I get a lot of sellers come direct to me because we know the one thing you need to do is you need to be able to perform. And Dan, I'm sure you see this as well. If you don't perform, it's a small community and people will know you don't perform and you can't close a deal and then I can come to you. The other thing is if you can't close, if you're going to go in and wholesale those deals, I think it's probably becoming harder and harder to wholesale deals when you have guys like us out there that are going in. And we always tell people it's, it's not that we... We're out there to buy your property, but if some reason we have too many or it's not something we want to buy, we might sell it off. But the bottom line is when we go to, when we tell you we're going to pay you this amount of money for your property, we're going to close. So you have nothing to worry about. Now, a lot of wholesalers out there that are doing that, they can't close on the deal. So it's either they hurry up and they find a buyer or they don't close. So we get properties that way too. Um, and I get, a, believe it or not, I get a lot from property managers, being that I'm in these different markets. Because a property manager does not want to lose that that uh, property in their portfolio, 
So they know that if an owner has 100, 200 properties in his portfolio and he wants to, they want to sell it off, they'll, come, they'll call me because they know I'll keep it with that property manager. And, I have a, and they know I can close on that deal. So I don't waste anyone's time. If I'm going to close, I, I close all the time. I, never, I, I don't ever back out. I don't play games. Um, as long as you're honest with me about, you know, the condition and the title and the taxes and stuff like that, I don't usually retrade a deal unless there's something you didn't tell me. So those are really the four ways that I get my deals. But I would say for the most part, it's mostly asset managers, special asset managers and uh, tax liens. Yeah, that's pretty cool, Dan, because my number one source is direct to sellers. We do, you know, an outrageous amount of marketing. But then my second source is like referral deals. So I have, you know, wholesalers in each market that are bringing deals. If it's something I can buy, we'll buy the property. If it's something that, you know, I'm not interested maybe in buying, I have huge buyers lists to send them out. Uh, we also have in that same category referrals. We've been finding that real estate agents that happen to be, you know, in my network, and they operate in neighborhoods that are, I don't know, for example, two, three hundred thousand. They're used to selling houses at, you know, one hundred fifty thousand, two hundred thousand or more. And then they get the right. lead in some neighborhood that's, you know, twenty, thirty grand, and it's like they're not comfortable even going to that property. And normally these agents are just kind of blowing them off. And so we've been doing a significant number of deals just recently with real estate agents referring us properties in neighborhoods that they just don't want to. They just don't want to go there and handle it. You know, the squatters, the, the, the same things I'm sure you deal with. Any low price neighborhood, the squatters, changing the locks, the copper stolen, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, like, a lot of agents, that's, like, real scary stuff, you know? Oh, yeah. And, and what's great um, is you just told people, you're just telling people here now that why you're, why you're so successful. And, and I admire what you're doing, too, just the same as the vice versa as you're doing with me because you have the processes and you have the systems, process, and people in place. I mean, you really have, by by far, you have one of the best processes in place to do what you're doing. I've been watching what you're doing, and uh, I'm impressed, and I love it. And uh, your process is even much better than mine, you know. But uh, and that's why you're able to do what you have, and you set up the right teams. So it's it's phenomenal what you're doing. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, and thank God for the right people. I mean, you probably know, like any successful person knows, finding the right people to play the positions on the team is critical. And without, you know, some would say luck, I would say the hand of Providence, you know, introducing me to the right people at just the right time in their career slash life at the same time in my career slash life where I had a great opportunity for these partners who showed up and the people on my team and they happened to be at a place where they were looking at it. Because you, you know how hard it is. If so, it'd be like me coming to you, Dan. So you're a highly successful individual. And I'm like, hey, Dan, you want to come out and do X, Y, Z on my team? And you're like, you already got a bigger opportunity going. So like a lot of times the highest quality people are already too busy to like join the team. And then if you have somebody that's like not of the caliber to perform the part trying to join the team, you kind of get jammed up. So you need just the right person who's like just on that upswing of quality, at least I've found, for us to succeed long term. And I, re I really am blessed with a great team. So speaking of <laughs> the team, you, yeah. do you have like a team around you? Have, how have you been getting all these deals done so far, Dan? That's great you say that. And I was laughing because I just literally got off the phone with my coach because I, I use a coach as well. And I believe everyone should have a coach. But uh, my coach is actually, that's what he's an expert in. And uh, that's what I've actually switched over the last, i got to say over the last year, I've really taken my team on steroids. I do have teams in each market. And uh, you're right. The problem with a team is, the problem in this industry is, I was telling him the same thing, is, and I'll tell you this, this is the toughest thing, and everyone's listening, just understand you're not going through this yourself. This is the toughest thing I've gone through in this industry, is getting the right people in place. Friends usually don't work out. Family doesn't work out. Um, you want to help them so much. But I've always been big on building businesses. And, and when I coach other people, because we, we do coaching, we get sent out to, to organizations and we coach them, I always teach them the same thing. It says take your time hiring, but fire very quick. But in this business, with, with your team, you have to realize you're looking – the problem that everyone has is they're looking – for somebody to do too much or what they're not qualified. And that's what my problem was. I had people coming in and I was trying to get them to do different things that they weren't qualified in. And what I learned is you have to get people on your team to do what they're good at. And and that's it. And get them to focus on what they're good at and that's it. If somebody's good on your, your acquisition manager, stop having them go and do construction. Stop having them handle contractors. Stop having them handle property management. Stop having them handle marketing. They are your acquisitions uh, person. 
have a marketing person. So um, I do. I have a marketing person I brought in. Um, she's phenomenal. Blessed to have her. She holds me to the fire because I'm horrible to market. That's not my strong point. I have acquisition managers in each in each area that I'm in. So in different markets I'm in, I have I have two to three acquisition managers in each market. Here in Delaware, I have two acquisition managers who brought on. Their job is to go out, look at the properties, assess the properties, and they both have contractor experience, which is huge for me. So, but their job is not to do anything else but acquisition manager. I have property managers, people that just handle my rental stuff. I have people that handle my legal now. So they just handle legal documents. So especially with me handling tax liens and non-performing notes, they're handling, you know, allonges, assignments of mortgage, dealing with the attorneys, those type of things. So what what I have is right now we have a team. Our team is probably, I'm going to, I don't even know exactly, I think about 26 or 28 people in the three markets we're in. But what I've done and what I've changed so greatly is I've focused in, and, and that's where my coach is an expert in. You know, he's closing 100-plus deals a month and doesn't even touch anything, see anything, do anything. That's really where I had to go with this market. So if that can help anybody out there, just understand, you know, the, the problem in this industry with, with people on your team, and, and Dan said it too, is that the people you're looking for, are people you want to have that entrepreneurial spirit. The problem is most people with entrepreneurial spirits are out there doing it themselves. And I always laugh I always laugh about this. I said, you know, in a market, if we ever got together and put a couple of us entrepreneurs together, we'd take down the world. But but we're all out there doing it ourselves and because we have an entrepreneurial spirit. We don't want to work for somebody else. But then you're on your other spectrum, you get the people that are just lazy and don't want to do anything. And that drives us nuts because we think they should be entrepreneurs. <laughs> So it's, we have to get out of our own way. The bottom line is get out of your own way. Figure out the hardest thing to do is self-reflect. Look in the mirror. See what you're good at and what you're bad at. And don't do what you're bad at at this point. Okay? Because that's the biggest problem. A lot of people are trying to do too much. Or they realize, here's another big one. They say to themselves, I'm not going to hire somebody until I make enough money to hire them. Uh, you'll always be chasing. You'll always be behind the eight ball. Unfortunately, the hardest thing to do is hire your first person. Once you do that, you ramp up so fast, you don't even know what to do with yourself. Okay? My next thing, my next person I want to hire is I want to hire, like, a human resources rep. That they can handle all the people for me because I don't even want to hire them. It's just I don't like doing it. I don't want to do what I don't like doing. And, and ultimately, I'm the laziest investor. You, you tell people I'm grinding, but the reason I like my passive income is because I'm lazy. I want to sit in my coffee shops. I want to sit on the beach in the summer. I want to hang out with my wife and kids and coach softball and football, and that's what I want to do. And that's the lifestyle I've been able to give myself. You know, and I don't, I'm not sitting there drinking out of coconut and telling people to buy a course for me. I don't sell a course. <laughs> but um, I'm just a lazy investor. And, you know, it's funny because uh, I'll sidetrack a little story. Uh, just recently, one of my properties here in Delaware that, you know, my wife is actually handling my stuff in Delaware. She's she's a phenomenal property manager. Yeah. But um, one of my properties, uh, the washing machine broke, and we had a washing machine at another property. It was good. We just added new one, so we had it in the garage. So it's like, well, we've got to go to the property and pick up that washing machine and bring it to the other property. I said, I'm not doing Why would I do that? Get my son Johnny to do it. And she's like, well, why do you think we're going to send him over there? And I said, pay him to do it. Pay him 50 bucks to go do it. She goes, why would we pay anyone to do it? Because I'm not going to waste three hours of my time going and doing something. She goes, you don't want to do anything. I go, exactly. I don't want to do crap. So that's why I'm in this business. I've done it for 26 years. I'm, I'm in this business. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I hire the team to do the job. If I can't make more than $50 in three hours, well, then I better go get a job somewhere because I'm doing it wrong. You just have to, and it's real important. So not to get off that topic, but hire a team. That's why it's so important. But you're right. The, the, the hardest part is finding that right person. And I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, just really dig down deep. And look for that person and make sure. The other thing you do when you hire somebody, give them a job description. That was the other thing I used to do wrong. I didn't give them a job description. I didn't tell them what they had to do. I didn't hold them to a standard. And if you don't do that, people don't know what, what success and what not success is. Like when you have an investor. When you have an investor, you bring them in, you should always ask them, what kind of return are they looking for? Because if not, you have no idea if they're a qualified investor or not for you. Just getting out of your own way, it's probably because you're screwing things up if you don't have a good a good team. And it was me. I was I was humbled. My butt was kicked by my coach, and I was humbled. I want to switch gears here a little bit. I do want to talk about some examples of, like, let's say I have some money, Dan, and I'm going to come to you, and we're going to do a joint venture together. I want to make 
25% on my money. You let me know if that's unrealistic or what would you offer? And I'm only saying 25% because I'm going with something outrageous. And honestly, I guess it just sounded outrageous. So I want to go with that example. Yeah. <laughs> well, that would be a pretty quick call. Um, you wouldn't be a qualified investor of mine. And I would ask you, I usually I ask some more questions. I understand what your goals are and I understand what your capacity is. If you need your payments monthly, if you're looking to stay in the deal a year, two years, um, if you're okay with the non-performing note space. The, the thing with the non-performing note space, there's no way to guarantee any, any investment. I would never guarantee any return to anybody. But in a non-performing note space, there's times I can make 12% for my investor, and there's times I can make 50% for my investor. The problem is when you make that 50%, 60% for your investor, they expect that every single time. I always under-promise and over-deliver. But I usually tell my investors, I said, listen, I cannot promise you anything about returns. What I can promise you is I'm going to do this, this, and this. And I lay out all my due diligence, the market I'm in, the team I have, why I'm in the market, and my experience. Secondly, what I do, what I do tell them is I said, here's some of my past investments. Here's what my goals are. Most of my investors are happy making 8 to 10%. At this point, I have investors telling me they're happy with 6% in a, in a stable market uh, because what's happening with the, you know, stocks, mutual funds, bank, you know, they put the money in the banks, their CDs are quarter percent for five years. They just want to be in it. You know, they want to see their IRAs grow. But what we do is our joint venture deals, we work them so many different ways. But ultimately, the way we work is my joint venture partners, they will put up the, all the funds, the funds to acquire the property or the asset, I should say, not a property paper, uh, to do the due diligence, to do the workout, the rehab, uh, get the property performing, and then we do a, either a 50-50 or 60-40 split, whatever it might be. For me, at this point, you'll see a lot of new investors out there going crazy to raise money. For me, I'm very particular who I raise money from. For reasons, I don't really need the money for most people. Um, we have a lot of money behind us right now because we've been doing so long. We've returned. We've done such good, such good amount of deals with the returns. The hardest thing for us is getting the money on the street, not getting it. Uh, once you return investors' money, they're, they're actually upset. They want that money in play. So I look at it like this. If I can raise money at 6 8 10%, do, do I really want to work with you? If it's somebody I really like, and they're not a pain in my butt, yeah, because maybe I could take down some more assets that way. We've done funds before. We're probably, after the new year, going to start a new fund, uh, take down some more assets, and then at that point, yeah, maybe we'll take some more money. From, and we only work with qualified investors. Uh, we want to make sure we're not taking somebody's last fifty or $100,000, and they need that money to pay their bills, because we don't want to make decisions, rash decisions on our deals, because somebody needs their money back right away. So we're not the right investor. We're not new. So we're not like these newbies out there running around will take money from anybody. They don't know the industry, so they just need money to take down deals, and then they figure it out later. And I know because, unfortunately, I get stopped coaching some of those people. But that's kind of how it is. If you're telling me, listen, I want double-digit returns, you know, it's more realistic, I'd, I'd be okay, you know, discussing it further. If you came to me and you said, well, because what I would say is, you know, what kind of returns you look for? You say 25%. There's no need for you to be in our deal. That makes sense. I guess I, I chose an extreme example. I mean, 10, 12%, yeah. um, you know, 8, 10, depending on the JV 50, 50. Sometimes you knock it out of the park. So I'm obviously out here doing the work and, and seeing returns like that in my business. So that's why, you know, right. when, I'm, when I'm working myself. But then some of my returns are also eaten up because I'll pay my investors the same 8, 10, 12%, what have you. What capital amount, Dan, would you say somebody you would be qualified for? If someone comes to you with 25000 you put in a deal, 50, 100, what are your minimum capital requirements? Usually I don't take less than 100, but mi minimum I would do is 50. And the reason why is I don't want to get – you can get involved with notes or tax liens with, you know, fifteen to $20,000. But then you're buying those type of assets in markets I don't want to be in. So it's not the right fit for me. And if I want to be in markets where I, I do my due diligence and I have my teams in place, and I'm pretty sure, you know, without guaranteeing anyone a return, I'm pretty sure we're going to get nice returns and we have a great exit strategy, then on anything under 50000 just is not, is not a right fit. And, and if you're under that price, you're probably not a qualified investor, so it might not work anyway. Because I'll tell you this, once somebody hands us 50000 we do a great job, the next time we do, they're like, oh, we got about a half a million dollars to work with you. And as an aside, not part of our interview here, but I just want to mention it because it's pertinent for anybody listening. We talked quickly here about the IRA 
self-directed IRA. And if anybody is interested in finding out more about that, I will link in the show notes of this episode to a previous episode we did with Carl Fisher, and we dive into oh, that okay. at a, a little bit of an intro level. So I'll make sure I, I link that for the listeners, um, and awesome. you can get some more information about uh, setting up, moving your IRA to self-directed, and really getting some clarification on like kind of how to be a private lender to invest in deals like Dan is describing here. Um, so Dan, I am going to switch to our questions, which we ask every guest who comes on the show. And the first of which is, who would be the most successful real estate investor or developer that you know, and why do you believe they're successful? Some of the most uh, successful people I know right now are Grant Cardone, which I'm sure a lot of people have. And uh, he's on a level that has a mindset that most will never attain. I love his mindset, that 10x rule, that everything he works on, on every deal I love the way uh, – what I love about Grant is the way he thinks outside the box. And I'm very similar to Grant like that. We all think very much outside the box, and that's what sets us apart in this industry. In fact, just um, – side note, I just re- – before this, I got a coaching call this morning with one of my students who does non-performing notes like myself. He just went into a deal with tunnel vision and almost lost the property to get out of it rather than actually think outside the box, take the deal, find multiple ways to, you know, make money on that deal. Because his goal in his life, his goal was to have the lifestyle that I'm living now, or that I that I'm aspiring to get to. I'm still not exactly where I'm on yet, because I have some pretty big goals. But he, you know, his goal, and he he didn't think outside the box. He had the tunnel vision. So what I love about Grant is Grant will take a deal that nobody else could take, and he'll find a way to make it happen. And he's always stepping up his game. He's always challenging himself. And the guy is worth a ton of money. He's, he can retire now and be the most successful multifamily investor out there I, I know out there and I've had a chance to meet him and uh, he doesn't stop so he's somebody right there the other one I have to say is Mark Evans who's my personal coach I mean Mark is just he's a vision man that guy is awesome I'm sure a lot of people here know him but he set up a team virtually and his team his process his systems are amazing the guys doing 100 plus deals a month in markets he doesn't even go to he doesn't even look at the properties he doesn't talk to anybody he doesn't deal with contractors. He doesn't deal with tenants. He doesn't deal with property managers. He just, all he did was set up that team. I shouldn't say all he did. He set up the team, process the systems. So he's somebody living the life I want to aspire. And what he does great is he gets out of his own way to do what he loves. And once again, every night, I think everybody out there should find a coach for everything in life, whether it be investing, uh, your relationships, uh, health whatever it might be. And uh, he's my personal coach and told me what I'm good at and not good at. And so I was able to handle real estate investing the right way because he's handling like steroids right now. Those are the two people I look, there's so many more I look up to. I mean, Les Brown. I mean, there's so many, I can keep going on and on about coaches and, and things like that and, and developers, but um, you know, you Donald Trump's and, and I can keep going, but those two come to mind when I saw this question. So, yeah, those two are the ones I, I follow, like, immensely. And I probably have a guess of a few of them, but uh, do you have two or three you would consider life-changing books, maybe real estate, maybe business, or mindset and success related? Yeah, definitely. That was actually a tough question because, I mean, I could rattle off probably 50, and it's hard to decipher which ones I like more or less. It all depends on what's going on. But um, on the real estate side, one of the biggest things for me was George Antone's Banker's Code being that I'm a passive guy and I like being the bank. He laid it out really simple. And he's another person I was lucky enough and blessed enough to speak on stage with or speak in the same event with. And uh, George is a great guy, has a great story. So I love that book by George Intel on the bankers. Because anyone that really likes that passive income to be in the bank, you really want to pick up that one of George's books or get a chance to hear him. Uh, I also love, like everyone else, I think I have to say, I just started rereading it probably for the 10th time is The uh, Four-Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. That's probably, I got to say, that's my number one book. I mean, I have it. I think the pages are folded. They're, ri- they're written on. They're, they're messed up. But, you know, eventually I'll probably have to get a new one of these. But, uh, you know, a friend of mine shared it with me years ago. And uh, this is my second version already, so I already shared it with me. But that's, that's probably one of the best books. I, I think that's my number one. And uh, another real estate one is obviously going to be everyone should read Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. That's that should be a, a, a mandate in schools right now. Um, that'll get your mindset changed. But I, obviously, I don't think schools want you to read that. A mindset book I really love, which I don't even know if a lot of people read it or even know about it. But you know, I got a chance to meet these guys too. There's a book Life and Air 
by Steve Cook and Sean McCloskey. It's just, and for me, it's, there's, like I said, there's so many books, but this one really hit home because it's actually, you know, people want to be millionaires, but they don't know how to be life and heirs. And this really, for me, it embodies everything I work towards. That's a great book to pick up. Uh, these are great guys. They, they run their own little events too here and there, but the book is phenomenal. So uh, that's, that's one of the books I really like. Yeah, Tim Ferriss was a, an eye-opening, changing experience for me to read that book. And uh, I love when it comes up on the topic because I, I also, a few years later, read, and I got such great results from Tim Ferriss. He has a podcast. I've gotten a lot of great, cool ideas from his podcast as well. Uh, maybe I should link to that in the show notes. But he had The 4-Hour Body, which I read about a year ago. And uh, I lost 25 pounds in maybe Good. a fifth a 50 to 60 day period as a result of, you know, directly what was in that book. So uh, he just, he just wow. puts together some really powerful information. And so like, you know, weight, you wouldn't think weight loss in the business would go hand in hand. And I did it without, I, I mean, it was like, you know, I went on the treadmill one time, Dan, it was like no, you know, intense cardio. It wasn't like the, the typical things you would hear about weight loss. It was like a very comfortable and easy thing for me to do at the time. So um, yeah, That's it was really awesome. cool. I liked it. Like to mention that. Appreciate what was the name that, of that book? What was the name of that, that book? Is, that's Four, four Hour hours. Body. And, and then uh, wow. that's Four Hour Body by Tim Ferriss. And then the other one that he wrote recently, which I'm reading now, which is like a – it's about the size of a Bible. It's called Four Hour Chef. And uh, that one actually dives deep into the process of learning new skills and things like that. And, uh, you know, he's a Princeton grad, so he gets pretty deep and detailed and has a lot of great examples and a lot of great information to share. I haven't finished that book yet, so I don't know how good or bad that one is as far as recommendation. But Four Hour Body, if if you know if weight loss or like you know health overall improvement in health is something that you want to do, even if it's not a weight loss issue, it's not a weight loss book. It's more of a you know health and lifestyle redesign, which was kind of the same tone of the Four Hour Work Week for anybody who didn't read it. So those are, I mean, they were two. Two great books. I think they're both available on Audible. So if you want to just listen instead of reading, I mean, they're both uh, both great awesome. information there. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Cool. Dan, if you could share the crown jewel of wisdom with your 18-year-old self, what would that be? Definitely a, a couple of those. It's find a mentor who you want to emulate and always challenge yourself. And when I say that, um, I wish I found a mentor years ago. And that is so many mentors. I wish I found someone years ago that can actually challenge me. And the other thing is, you know, really, when I say challenge yourself, I always tell people I, I love being the dumbest person in a room or a meeting. If you're, if you're the smartest person in that room, you're definitely in the wrong room. You always got to reach out further and always challenge yourself to get a little bit better. Because if you're stagnant, your business is stagnant, you're going to go nowhere. Okay? And then uh, that's really – I always tell people that, that find a mentor and challenge yourself. That's ultimately what it comes down to. Nice. And then uh, if anybody's listening, wants to get some more information about you, do you have a website, phone numbers, emails, anything you'd like to share sure. with listeners? Sure. They could uh, go to my website. It's uh, Zitofsky, Z-I-T-O-F-S-K-Y, capitalmanagement.com. That's our new site. Uh, or they can get me at Dan at Zatofsky, capital uh, You know, shoot me an email. I'm pretty good about getting back to you within 24 hours or less unless I'm traveling and uh, I'd love to help out any way I could. And I think that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Cool. And then uh, for the listeners, I will add that website address URL in the show notes as well. Uh, so if you didn't catch that and write it down, you can always check out the show notes and get that information. Hey, Dan, I have a couple pages, three, four pages of notes here. I took while we were on the call, a lot of great information. I'm intrigued to check out some of these other uh, emerging markets myself. It's always great to hear, you know, perspective of successful people like yourself and i appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on the show uh, and i appreciate you having me dan you got a great show and i love your business as well and i uh appreciate i'm blessed that you actually caught enough of us to bring us on for your listeners thanks so much absolutely and thank you for listening to this episode of the rei diamond show are you interested in receiving an email notification when the future episodes are sent and ready you can either sign up at www.reidiamonds.com or subscribe through one of the podcasting apps, including iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, which will automatically notify you of new episodes as they are updated. Are you also interested in either buying a deal from me or presenting one of your deals or listings for me to buy from you? 
Either way, you can submit the deals you'd like to sell or check out the deals I have for sale in Chicago, Atlanta, Florida, or Philadelphia by going to www.reidiamonds.com and clicking the link at the top of that page. And finally, if you have certain questions or topic suggestion for me that you'd like discussed on a future episode, or if you have a guest suggestion or would like to become a guest on the show, you can do that by checking it out. There's a link at the top of the page at www.reidiamonds.com. I get those notifications directly. So thanks again for being a loyal listener of the show. Dan Breslin here. I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin. To receive email notifications of new weekly episodes, sign up at www.reidiamonds.com.